yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rap with fans. Uh, I'm sure you're excited today as I've been sponsoring all week and I came through. We have Mark, uh, one of the co founders of Duffy B. The, I think he's written the most code, right? We've looked at this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have. Okay. Uh, and he did his PhD at CWI, which again is the top school in uh, one of the top schools in in oh, yeah. CWI. <laughs> Why is all the things that we talked about this entire semester? So um, again, if, if you have questions for Mark, if you go along, just stop and interrupt, and uh, that way it's a conversation. Okay. All right. Perfect. Go, go for it. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, for the introduction and the invite. I can skip my first slide. Those are always the best introductions. Uh, yeah, so I'm Mark. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Um, and I'm going to be talking about DuckDB. Um, so DuckDB, it's something that um, we, me and Hannes, co-developed at the CWI during my PhD. Um, and it's in a database system, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, and it's an in-process analytical database system. So um, essentially, there is this kind of big a standard in database systems, which is that uh, you have this client server architecture, right? So you have the you have a, a database server sitting somewhere, and then you have your client that talks to the server. And that's very useful in some situations, like when you want to uh, share data between multiple people, multiple clients. But there is this kind of alternative architecture that I think SQLite is like the prime example of um, that allows you to run your database kind of as a library inside your application. And that has a number of cool advantages. And that's one of the reasons that we started building DuckDB is but, uh, because we realized it was kind of like a, a, a gap, like somewhere where database systems could be getting used, like all the cool technology that Andy has been describing to you, all the cool technology that the database community has been working on could be getting used, but wasn't getting used. And that's kind of what DuckDB is, uh, our tagline, or like what we like to say is we're the SQLite for analytics. Um, and that's for... Uh, the, the main reason is because we're also in process um, and we try to follow a lot of the same design principles of SQLite, like that it's easy to use, easy to set up. And I think for analytics, one of the cool features of being in process is that you can exchange data very easily with your host process, right? Because you're both like next to each other instead of having this um, like socket connection. So you can very quickly switch from your application code to your database system and back. And that basically allows for some very cool use cases, um, specifically for analytics. Um, so DuckDB, it's free and open source. It's MIT licensed. We have a website. Um, yeah, if you if you haven't heard about it already, feel free to check it out. We have two, uh, so, we have two students so, doing we have two groups doing projects with DuckDB. <laughs> excellent, excellent. That's what I like to hear. Uh, so the first question we always get about DuckDB is why do you call it DuckDB, right? Like it's a bit weird. Uh, the reason is that Honus, uh, like the co-creator of DuckDB, my previous PhD supervisor, used to own a pet duck. So Honus, uh, it, uh, yeah, he lived on the boat and he wanted to get a pet. And he thought, well, being on a boat, getting a pet can be potentially problematic, right? Because there's water. Uh, what can swim? And the answer was a duck. So this is Wilbur. And he is our inspiration for naming the system DuckDB. So that's kind of the, 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 the canonical version, uh, why it's called DuckDB. Uh, the dog sees the picture of the duck, it's freaking out. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I wasn't aware there was gonna be other, uh, other animals. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I have also already given a talk um, at this course previously three years ago. Uh, in 2020, back when the pandemic first started and everything was moving online. Um, and it was very cool. It was quite a long time ago in terms of DuckDB years because the system is very young. At the time, it was way younger, right? And a lot has happened. So as you can see, back then I was still working at CWI uh, full-time as a researcher. We didn't have a spin-off yet. Um, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have also changed, uh, kind, of, kind of stayed the same. So I kind of want to talk about the system, but also the evolution of the system and what, what we've been up to, essentially. I would say, Mark, uh, you're, you're the first person I invited when the, when, when the quarantine hit. I invited you first. We wanted you to come first. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I had a great uh, great time back then, which is why I was so eager to do it again, of course. Yeah. Um, so here you can see our commit history on GitHub. 
And it's kind of funny, you can see the CMU talk, it's right at the beginning. And uh, well, things have kind of picked up. And of course, the reason is that back then, it was just me and Hannes working on this, right? Nowadays, uh, many more people are using it and many more people are working on it as well. We're also getting a lot more uh, external contributions and we have a much bigger team working on it. So there's just a lot of stuff happening. And as you might imagine, we have been doing some stuff in this like big green cloud to the right of this previous, uh, previous talk again. So yeah, one of the big changes like on an organizational level is that we actually have a company now. So um, we made a spinoff from the CDBI called DuckDB Labs and that provides consulting services around DuckDB. And we actually have a team of people that work on DuckDB now. Uh, a lot of them are from the CWI uh, before, like uh, people did their master's thesis there, people did their uh, bachelor project there, people did, did their PhD there. But we also have some other people from other, uh, um, other schools, other uh, backgrounds. Um, so yeah, we actually have people like working on documentation, which is something that before, like everything was just done by me and Hannes. So that's a uh, yeah, big, big, big difference there. Um, all right, so let's talk about tech, of course, the database, that's why we're here, right? Um, there's this very nice slide that I made, I think four years ago, um, which surprisingly has stood the test of time. Uh, so this is kind of this high level overview of DuckDB of the system and kind of like at a glance what we're all about when it comes to the internals. So, and none of these things have really changed. Um, they have changed internally, like we have changed the components very significantly, but at a, at a glance, it's still the same. So we're still a column store database. We haven't pivoted to a row store. Uh, we're still using a vectorized processing engine. Um, the storage format in DuckDB, it's a single file storage format similar to SQLite. So your whole database lives in one file instead of in one directory, which is kind of the norm for most database systems outside of SQLite. Um, we have an ARG index, uh, although we have made, been making a lot of improvements to it and a lot of uh, cool stuff around that. Uh, I won't actually be talking about that though. Um, we use MVC for our transaction management. It's written in C++ and we use the Postgres parser. So that's like at a glance what DuckDB is all about. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna talk mostly about the processing and the storage. Um, I will touch a bit on the MVC, but I unfortunately don't have time to get go into like in depth into all of the different thing, uh, components, then I would be uh, running out of time. Um, like I, I would need many more hours. Uh, so I'll be focusing mostly on the, the processing and storage here. We don't cover MVCC this semester anymore. So no worries. Oh, all right. Okay. Then, uh, well, I, I have one quick slide on it, but uh, I will just uh, zo zoom by that one. Um, cool. All right. So DuckDB, it uses a vectorized push-based model. And as I'm sure Andy has told you uh, many times through this course, what that means is that instead of having a tuple, like a row based, a, a, a row, row at a time model, uh, you have a vector at a time model. And that means that vectors are kind of your unit of data that flow through the system, that flow through the operators, right? Um, so these vectors, they're kind of the bread and butter of the engine. And I think it's worth spending a bit of time talking about DuckDB's vector format because it's such an integral part of the, of the system, right? Like all intermediate data is represented as vectors. So DuckDB, it has a custom vector format and it's quite similar to Arrow. Um, it has some similarities to Arrow, but it's different as well. And the differences are mostly towards us designing this format entirely for execution. So Arrow is a very uh, awesome uh, vector format, obviously, but it does a lot of different things. Like it does, you can serialize it, you can stream it over a socket, right? Um, you can write it to disk, you can read it back. We don't, uh, our vector format doesn't need to do any of those things. It's designed solely for execution. Uh, and we have made some changes to the, for, uh, we have done some optimizations um, to enable that. And our vector format, it was actually co-designed with the Velox team. So Velox, um, it has the same vector format as DuckDB. So vectors, they're kind of, they're kind of like a, a slice of a single column, right? So they hold data of a single type. And for scalar types, vectors, they're kind of just arrays, right? Like if you have an integer vector, you just have an array of integers. So in this case, you have an array, array of integers of one, two, three, four, five. Um, one thing that's kind of different in, in DuckDB is that we have a vector type. And that doesn't change what a vector represents logically, but it changes how the data is represented physically. 
And what's cool about the vector type is that it allows us to push compressed data through the engine and operate directly on compressed data without having to decompress it in the sources. So these are uh, some of the vector types that we have. So at the you have the flat vector, the uncompressed vector. That's kind of like the standard vector. Like that's how a, a cookie cutter vectorized engine would what a, a cookie cutter vectorized engine would operate on, right? You just have arrays. Uh, but we also have these other uh, vector types. We have a constant vector, for example. And in a constant vector, logically, the array has for every entry the same value, right? So in this case, our logical view is just a bunch of ones. But because we know this, we have this information, we can just say, okay, physically, we only need to store the first, like we only store this value once, right? Like we don't need to actually repeat it in our storage level. Um, and that's very useful, not just to save space, actually space saving on vectors, it's not super relevant because it's just an intermediate layer, right? But it's uh, important because it allows us to do optimizations. Because if we have two constant vectors and we do an operation like we want to add them together, what we can do is we can just look at this one value and add it to this other one value. And we don't need to look at like all the values. We don't, we don't need to look at the entire array, right? Like it allows us to optimize, like push this compression into the actual execution. Uh, another very important vector type is the dictionary vector. And that's kind of like if you have dictionary compression at your storage level, you have like a dictionary, like a set of unique values, and you have an index into that set of unique values. And the dictionary vectors, they allow us to uh, store such a, such a, such a, um, such, such a data set physically like that, right? So we have our dictionary, which is our unique values, and we have the indexes. So in this case, we have A, B, A, A, B, but the way we store it is we store A and B as distinct values, and then we store 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, right? Like the index into the dictionary. And that's cool because it allows us to read directly um, from our dictionary storage or from the dictionary storage in Parquet and emit these dictionary vectors. And it allows our, uh, uh, our execution to optimize for this because sometimes maybe you want to only do a, a, an operation that influenced the dictionary uh, and you don't even need to touch the indexes, right? Or maybe you can say like, oh, I need to compute the hashes of a bunch of big strings, but I know they're duplicate eliminated. So instead of doing it once for every value, I do it once for every entry in the dictionary and it can save a bunch of time. Um, another vector type we have is the sequence vector. This is not very commonly used, but it's used for stuff like row IDs. Um, and that's basically if you have a sequence of values like one, two, three, four, five, right? You can store that as a base and an increment instead of storing the actual values. Um, now, when it comes to actually processing these vectors, right, you need to operate on, uh, on them in some capacity. You can compress them as is, right? Like you can say, oh, I have a flat vector, I have a constant vector, I'm gonna look at the physical representation and I'm going to um, do the operation. However, because we have all these different vector types, you run into a, a combinatorial explosion problem, right? If I have two parameters to my function, now suddenly I need to do a flat, 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 constant, flat dictionary, uh, constant, constant. You get, you get the picture. And solving this is not only like a major engineering sort of hurdle, it also is problematic from a code footprint perspective because in this vectorized engine, you pre-compile everything, right? Uh, which is great for this because uh, it allows you to do dynamic switching very fast, right? Um, you can just say, oh, now I have a flat and a constant. Now I can do this specialized operator. Now I have a flat and a flat. Now I can do the normal operator. Now I have a constant and a constant. I can do this specialized operator, right? Like you don't need to compile this combinatorial explosion, but you also, you don't, you don't really want to because it creates this giant code footprint. So um, what you often want to do is just have a function that, imp that operates on, that's, that isn't specialized, essentially. It just operates on a... Um, well, the, the just does the operation once. And there's two ways of doing it, kind of like the straightforward ways to say, oh, I can just decompress the vector, right? I can just convert it into a flat vector. Um, however, that has the downside that I need to move and copy data around, right? Like I need to, if I have a constant vector, I need to replicate my value and actually create the logical array that I was kind of avoiding to create before. Um, and in order to avoid this, we have a unified view, a unified format over the vector that allows us to process these vectors 
without having to um, do this moving or copying it around. And this works for our three like primary um, vector types, the flat vector, the Collins vector, and dictionary vector. And the unified format, it's uh, in essence, it's quite simple. It's just an array and a set of indexes into that array, right? So you have like two sort of structures. And for a flat vector and for a constant vector, the kind of the, 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 key, the key ingredient here is that they're always the same. So if I have a flat vector, right, an uncompressed vector, uh, I always want to access the elements in order. I want to access the first element, the second element, the third element, the fourth element, right? Uh, that's the, the way I would logically access a vector. For a constant vector, I always want to access the first element, right? Like there's only one, so I want to do like first element, first element, first element. And these, uh, th these selection vectors, these indexes into the data, they're always there, they're constant. And basically what we can do is we can just allocate them once statically and then just set a pointer to them and keep reusing them. And that way we don't have to do any sort of allocation or constructing of a vector to be able to construct this view of the data. Now for a dictionary vector, it works even nicer because it turns out that this is already a dictionary vector, right? You have the data, the pointers, and you have these set of indexes. So we can just use this stuff as is. And the cool thing about this unified format is that we can basically, without copying data, without moving data around, have this sort of unified view over these uh, vectors that allows us to implement um, our operators, our execution, um, without requiring any specialization and without penalizing the system by needing to do the moving uh, around of data, right? So it allows us to create this, uh, these generic operators in case we don't want to specialize in a fast and efficient way. Mark, so like these vectors, yeah. like for the different vector types, like, like this could be coming out of the DuckDB file format. So like, yeah. Right, so like you, you get a dictionary vector because that's in the file. But if you're reading from Parquet, are you, are you going to convert their, their dictionary format to your format, or are you just always, you always flatten it? So in Parquet, we also emit dictionary vectors. Yeah. And also some like functions can actually turn, like mostly constant vectors can be generated from functions. Okay. So we can say like, oh, uh, well, first off, if you have a constant in your query, it's a constant vector, right? So if you do plus one, it's a constant. Uh, but also if you pass like a null parameter, we can say, oh, now it's always going to be null. So we turn it to a constant. Um, so these things, they can come from different places. They can come definitely from our storage, but also from Parquet um, or yeah, from, if, ex from during execution, we can generate them as well. And then the, my next question is like, so once you get your higher up, say above the pipeline, would you ever have an operator spit out something that wasn't a flat? Like assuming it came in one way, would you ever say, oh, I, I know I can dictionary compress this in the upper part of the, of the query plan and set it up as a compressed vector? So there are some operators that turn things into constant vectors, but yeah. usually not. No, usually you would say, usually you, you kind of uh, go towards the flat vector, right? right. So yeah, it's it just the easier way of doing it. We don't do any sort of recompression um, unless it's like a clear sort of, we can prove statically this is always constant, so we're just gonna keep it constant. Yeah. Like for example, for our nested loop join, we use these constant vectors because we have to match one vector on one side with one L one row on the other side, right? So then we use these constant vectors. But in general, yeah, it stays as flat. Matt, do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious if, I mean, the, the constant vector is sort of a special case of the dictionary. Do you have an idea of like how much performance you gain by removing that indirection layer like between like a dictionary with one a dictionary vector with one element versus this this constant vector i mean i imagine it's quite a bit if you special cased it like this but yeah so i think the, the indeed you're right the strength of the const vector is that first well you don't need to store the list of indexes of course you could just add a, like a, a bunch of zeros there um but i think the yeah the strength is mostly that it's easy to special case in the constant vector so for the dictionary vector, very often we don't special case on that because there's just stuff that you probably, you don't necessarily want to specialize on for a generic dictionary. Whereas for, if you have two constants input, it's kind of like obvious, like it's always gonna be very beneficial to specialize on that. Makes sense, thanks. 
I had a good question. Yes. It's like, how do you guys like read data before you like choose which representation to like store your like vectors in within storage? Like, how does that process work? Like, how do you so decide should be like stored as like flat or dictionary, e.g. So our storage is actually not vectors, right? So it's uh, our storage format is kind of it's very compatible with our vectors, obviously, but it's not exactly our vectors. So there's a bunch of differences that, for example, in our storage, we do stuff like bit packing, right? But in our vectors, we only will ever have like integers, like in 32 or stuff like that, right? So um, it's just that from certain, like I'll talk a bit about the compression later. It's in my slides as well. But during the actual compression, we have more options than in our actual vectors. And some of those storage formats translate to vectors, but not all of them translate to different vector types as well. Wait, wait, this is not exactly my question. This is like, how do you like, let's say like a user is like insert values like one, two, or like one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, right? And in that case, mm -hmm. like dictionary format would be like, you know, pretty good for like storing like this data. But like, how do you determine whether to use the dictionary format versus like a flat format? But it's so, so this happens at the storage layer we have this compression phase that writes to disk, right? And then when we read from the storage format, then we can say, oh, our storage format is dictionary encoded, right? The storage has determined dictionary is the optimal representation for this. And then we emit dictionary vectors. Oh, okay, thanks, yeah. Right? Yeah. Cool. All right, so a bit more about, uh, well, different vector, different types of data within the vectors. Um, so scalars, integers are quite straightforward. For strings, um, we use the same format that Umbra uses, which is this kind of cool um, string format that allows you to inline short strings. And uh, it's described in the Umbra paper. The way this works is that you have 16 bytes for your string. And if your string is 12 bytes or less, then you inline it instead of storing a pointer to the string. If it is large, larger than 12 bytes, then you store a prefix because you have like these four bytes left over. Uh, you store a prefix, like the first four bytes of the long string. And this is cool for two reasons. Like first, the inlining is very beneficial because if you have long string, if you have a, a lot of short strings, you don't need to go, you don't have this memory access, you don't have this level of indirection. Uh, the other reason it's very cool is that you have this length and prefix as the first eight bytes always, whether or not it's inline or not, um, which means that if you're comparing strings, you can compare only the first eight bytes. Um, and if they are different, you know the strings are different. So that allows you to like very quickly reject um, comparisons between strings that are false, that are going to be false, uh, no matter the size of the string. So that's very, very cool. All right. Um, after the strings, we have nested types. And nested types, I think it's something that's kind of not discussed as much in the in the database literature, but something that we have found to be actually very important. Like a lot of people use nested types. Um, they come from like uh, JSON, obviously, but also people just like working with nested types. They do like a string split and then they have, have a nested type or they like to like uh, pre-normalize nested types. And while maybe uh, it's not, it kind of violates the relational model. That's some, kind of the view I had when I started going into this. They're like, nest types are very convenient and it's kind of important to do this fast. So that also is kind of reflected in our vector format because one possible solution to nested types, of course, is just store them as blobs or store them as strings. And that's very slow. And because you kind of go from your like highly optimized vectorized query engine, right? to a row store just because you're using a list or a struct, right? So instead of doing that, what we do is we store nested types recursively by using more vectors. And that's very similar to what Arrow does. And that's very cool because it allows for a highly efficient processing of these nested types. And it really speeds these things up immensely and allows us to reuse like all of our um, operators also for these nested types. So there's two like, core nested types in DuckDB that you can generally use to compose um, essentially whatever you want, right? Like you can compose these in any way you want. You can have like a list of structs, a structs of lists, a list of structs of lists. 
Um, you can have like very complex nested types. Well, these are like the two primitive nested types. Um, so the struct contains like a set of different values that each have a name. And you have a list, which is an, an array essentially, right? So every row can have zero to n values. Um, so for structs, it's kind of straightforward. Um, you just store each array as a separate vector. So in our struct here uh, to, the, to the right, we have um, two vectors. We have the item vector and the price vector. And the item just stores the, the values of the item uh, value within the struct, right? Like pants, t-shirt, shoes inside that vector. And the price vector similarly stores the values of the price. You do have like nulls at each of these different layers. So that's kind of something that's interesting is that the whole struct can be null, but the individual struct elements can also be null. So you have like a lot of validity mask, a lot of null values. Um, but that that's kind of like, yeah, how struct values are stored. And the reason this is quite straightforward is because a struct value vector, it always has the same cardinality as its parent vector, right? It's just like a wrapper around a set of vectors. Um, lists are a bit more complex and that's because lists uh, can have different lengths, right? Like you can have um, a list that has a million elements or a list that has zero elements. And that's also reflected in our um, vector representation in the sense that the child vector of a list vector can have a different length than its parent vector. And the way we store them is by having these offset length pairs that basically say, okay, my first list starts at this position within the child vector and it has this many elements. And this way you can store essentially any, any kind of nested data you want by composing these structs and lists, right? Like this child vector can, again, it can be another list vector or it can be a struct vector. And because of this is all recursive, you can store any nested data you want. And because it's all vectors, you can operate on them very efficiently. How do you handle yes. how do you handle when the type of a of a like I said a set of a struct is different from one one instance to the next? Like in this case here, say that the third guy has perhaps item instead of teacher, it's a list of, of stuff. So we don't support that in a normal struct. So the struct is by definition fixed type. Okay. We do support maps, and maps are um, essentially key value pairs. We do support that. And the way maps are stored is by a list of structs. So, yeah. um, and they, the list themselves, they can contain different keys for each row. But in a struct, like it's it's fully, the, the scheme of a struct is fully fixed. Got it, okay. Wayne, you have a question? Yep. Uh, structs are type, right? Are they named as in, can a struct recursively contain itself as a child type? So we don't have recursive nested types. So uh, the struct cannot contain itself as a child type. Cool, thanks. Cool. All right, so that was vectors and that's kind of the format that flows through the engine. Um, now let's talk about the actual engine, right? The query execution, the, the push-based model. So when I last presented at this course, and what we kind of started out with with DuckDB was a pull-based system. Um, and we switched later on to a push-based system. What we started out with was this vector volcano system. So I think you, you probably uh, know about the volcano model by now. Uh, I hope I'm not repeating uh, Andy too much. Um, what we had was this volcano model system where instead of having like individual rows that would flow through the system like a classic volcano model, we had chunks or vectors that flow through the system. And the way this looks like from a uh, like implementation perspective is that you have a bunch of operators and each operator implements this get chunk method. And um, basically these operators, they call get chunk recursively on their children. And by doing this, you can construct the result of the query by calling get chunk on the root elements, which will then in turn call get chunk on its children uh, until it reaches a scan, right? And then you can process the query like that incrementally. So here's kind of what that would look like for, for example, a hash join, right? You have a, a method called get chunk. It returns a chunk, right? Um, and then you have a like you have a build and a probe phase, right? It's a hash join. When the build is not yet finished, you go to the ride child and you say, hey, give me a chunk, build the hash table. Give me a chunk, build the hash table, right? You, 
fully exhaust the right child until your hash table is full. Then when the build is finished, you pull from the other side and you start probing this hash table, right? So relatively straightforward. Um, with the hash table, implementation of the hash table left as an exercise to the reader. Um, and that's kind of how this volcano model works also in our thing. And it's nice, it's straightforward for a single thread execution, right? So there, there's this there, there's this sort of thing about the volcano model. It's probably, I think probably one of the oldest models um, for implementing database engines, and it's fully geared towards single thread execution. And when the volcano model was initially designed, that was kind of all you needed. But nowadays, you really need multi-thread execution. Like you cannot really get around it anymore. And the reason for that is that, well, computers just have many, many cores nowadays, right? So um, if you go to AWS and you want to rent an instance, you can get a machine with like 200 cores. And 200, that's literally, it's more than two orders of magnitude, right? Like a, a multi-threaded system can be up to 200 times as fast on this machine than a single threaded system. Like it's not, it's not like difference between one, uh, it's not like twice as fast anymore, right? Like it's a literally two orders of magnitude speed up. So to give you some perspective on that, if you have a multi-threaded system that can place in one second on this machine, a single threaded solution, given that the multi-threading was optimal, et cetera, um, would complete in like more than three minutes, right? Like one second, three minutes. Um, if you had a multi-thread solution that finished something in one minute, it would take three hours single thread, right? Like these are, the, the, the differences have become staggering because there's just this, just this massive amount of cores. And we actually had people report bugs where they thought the system had gotten stuck uh, in queries when actually what happened was they had like um, made a change that forced it to trigger single thread mode. Um, and they would, it would finish multi-thread in like one minute. And then after 30 minutes of single thread, they would just give up and say like, there's a bug, this thing is stuck. So like it, this stuff, you, you can't get around multi-threading anymore in, well, current year. Um, it, it's really required, right? So there is this method of adding multi-threading to a Vulcano-based system. Um, and it's the exchange operator. And the way the exchange operator work, works is that you leave your operators kind of alone right? So your joins, your aggregates, your scans, um, they're mostly just left as is. They're like single thread. And then you have a optimizer that bakes the parallelism into the query plan. So it, like it divides up the query plans, multiple partitions. Uh, the partitions can then be executed independently. And then there's like this exchange operators, right? That's why it's called the exchange operator that does this sort of like the switcheroo between them. That does like, oh, now we do a repartition on a different attribute and we do like a split again. And that's kind of nice because it means that your operators don't need to be parallelism aware. And that's great, of course, if you want to bolt parallelism onto a single thread system. Um, it's kind of also the situation we had because when we started building DuckDB, it was built single thread. But we thought about it a lot and we thought, hey, this exchange model, we had some experience with it and it comes with a bunch of problems as well. So one of those is plan explosion. So you may uh, you may have seen this picture here, right? It's splitting into uh, it's splitting the plan into three distinct fragments, and it's all modeled in the plan. Now imagine the same plan, but you have two hundred fragments, right? Like there's many cores, so there's also big plans. And it turns out that a lot of the stuff database systems do with plans is not exactly linear. You always you, you often have like quadratic or sometimes even exponential stuff in plan size. So this plan explosion can cause a lot of problems. We've seen it cause a lot of problems. And uh, essentially it will force you to optimize your optimizers usually because your plans just like, even if you have a simple query, the parallelism will explode the plan, make it giant. And then suddenly your optimizers can't deal with it anymore. Um, there's also the problem of load impact. And the thing is that because you're baking all of the parallelism into the query plan, it's not dynamic anymore. It's like determined how you're going to parallelize it up front. And that can cause load imbalance issues because maybe you were wrong about your partitions or how the data is distributed. And now you have like half your threads doing nothing and the other half processing, which again, cause inefficiencies. The other problem is materialization costs, right? Like the only sort of... Um, way of communicating between these operators is 
materialize in rows, right? Like there's no other avenue of communication because the operators are all like parallelism unaware. So you have to materialize or, uh, and that has costs as well. So there's this great um, paper by the Munich guys about a alternative way of doing parallelism and it's called morsel driven parallelism. And in this model, instead of having these parallelism unaware operators, you make the individual operators parallelism aware. And that has uh, like some very cool side effects. Like you can have your input data distributed adaptively instead of having this all baked into the plan. Um, it, it kind of avoids all of these problems. So the way that this model works is that you look at a query plan, a query tree, right? And you split it into these pipelines on these pipeline breakers. So for example, in this query, we have a hash join between two tables followed by an aggregate, right? A group by. And what we do is we split it into two pipelines. The first pipeline is our hash table build, right? So we scan our sale table, push it into the hash table build side. And the second pipeline does the probing of the hash table followed by the actual aggregation. And these pipelines, they are then paralyzed internally, right? Because instead of having these oper uh, like parallelism unaware operators, you have parallelism aware operators. So the scan now knows, hey, this is how I partition my input. The hash join knows, hey, this is how I built a hash table given that I receive inputs in parallel, right? So all the, um, all the, the parallelism is no longer modeled inside the plan. It's modeled as part of the operators, like inside the operators themselves. Um, so that's a very cool model. It solves a bunch of these problems. But how do you do that in a pull-based model, right? So if you look at this volcano model, everything is entangled. You have a get chunk, it does a build, it does a probe, it does, a, it does all the flowing of data, right? Like everything is entangled in this one sort of method. So um, what we kind of slowly discovered was that you can't really do this in a volcano model very nicely um, because you need to split this stuff into pipelines, right? And you can't because it's all entangled. So that was kind of the catalyst for us switching to a push-based model. Um, and kind of the nice thing is that instead of having this single get data method, you have these separate interfaces based on where your operator sits, right? Like whether or not it's a source, it's an intermediate operator or it's a sync. And you can very cleanly actually model this parallelism awareness in the source and the sync by basically saying, okay, we have these states. You have, you have a global state, which is shared. You have a local state, which is like local to your thread. And you have quite a clean sort of parallelism model where you say, this is what I, th this is where I need to be careful that I'm not like, um, that I'm handling the, the, all, the parallelism correctly. And if you look at our previous plan uh, in our pipelines, you can kind of see where these sources and sinks are at, right? Like your scan, it's clearly a source and your sink, it's uh, the hash table build, um, the hash, uh, hash table build is a sink. In your second pipeline, uh, the scan is again a source and you can see the hash join, it's the same operator, but now it's an intermediate operator, right? So it gets a different, um, actually parallelism unaware implementation because the hash probe doesn't need to know about parallelism because it's a read only thing, right? Like you already have the hash table, you just need to read from the hash table. So it doesn't have to be parallelism aware. And then the group by, you again have a sync that is, um, that is parallelism aware. Um, and this is very cool. And the, and the nice thing is that it's all like, it's very nicely modeled. Uh, all the parallelism is there and the sources know how to split things up. The things know how to do the other thing in parallel. And yeah, I think it's just a very clean model and it's quite intuitive to work with in a sense as well. Um, there's some other cool stuff about a push-based model, which was also like a catalyst to us switching. And um, that's like, if you look at a pool-based model, right? all the control flow lives inside your operator. And on the one hand, that's very nice because it's super flexible, right? Like in an operator, you can always call your child. You can always say, get, get, give me more data or don't give me more data, right? Um, but we kind of discovered you don't really need that level of flexibility in a database system, right? Like you can model the control flow of a database system centrally without really losing out on anything. And modeling this as like a bunch of function calls that are like recursively called causes this sort of like a scenario where the call stack is now your state, right? Like um, when you call get chunk, 
it call that operator calls get chunk on its child. That operator calls get chunk on its child. So your call stack is actually an important part of your operator state now. And that causes a bunch of problems as well. Um, then you also have the fact that all this, um, all the control flow is duplicated inside each and, every, each and every operator, which means optimizing around the actual control flow gets more complex. So that's something that's really nice about the push-based model is that the control flow happens in a central location. Um, so the operator itself, they often get simpler because they don't need to know about the control flow, right? Like the projection now just says, oh, I have my input, I execute my expressions, and I go to my output. I don't no longer need to pull data from my child. And the state, which used to be like stored in the call stack, is stored as a bunch of like, uh, is like explicitly stored in a central location. And that allows some cool optimizations. Like for example, we have this operation optimization where we have a cache in between operators. And the reason for that is that you can have operators that reduce the size of your vectors, right? Like a filter or a, a probe of a hash table. And a vectorized engine, it's kind of built on this idea that you want to have vectors that are like kind of full. Because if you have vectors with one row in them, then you have regressed to a tuple at a time model, right? Like it's slow again. Um, and what can happen if you have a selective filter is that everything after is kind of optimized for the fact that you have many elements in your vector. Um, so if you emit only one row at a time from your filter, the rest of your engine gets slower. And this can actually get you into worse performance than a tuple at a time model, because at least a tuple at a time database is built for this, right? Like we're not optimized for that at all. So um, the solution is to add like small caches between these operators that can reduce cardinality. And by having the control flow in a central location, uh, that makes it very easy because you can just look at, hey, does my, uh, like my, do my vectors have like a low amount of elements? Then I buffer them, right? Um, another cool thing about a push-based model is that you control where your results go. And that means you can do scan sharing very easily. So if you scan data from a source, you can then push it into multiple sinks, right? Because uh, you control where the data goes. You can just push it into an aggregate and push it into a different aggregate. And that kind of, um, that, that's kind of, you can probably hack this into a pull-based system, but in a push-based system, it's something that is very intuitive, right? Like it's just, you push the different things and you're done. Sure. Another cool, oh. Actually, yeah, I, I just go to ask about like back pressure. What if like the scan is shared by two operators, but the two operators are consuming the data in like different speed? For example, like the aggregation is very simple, but another side of like scan sharing is like drawing, which is like somehow complex to look at. So, in this so case, that's a th that's a good question. So currently, our uh, sinks they're kind of like blocking in that sense. So we would execute them one after the other, right? Uh, so that's not really a problem. If you get into like async IO sort of stuff, then this can be a problem. You need to apply back pressure somehow. But currently that's not a problem for us yet. Um, yeah, so another uh, cool thing about the push-based model, because your state is stored in, in a central location, you can, stop, right? You can set aside the state and resume later. It allows you to pause execution of like a pipeline or something. And that's useful because, uh, because of different reasons. So one potential reason could be if you're pushing data into a sink and that sink has like a fixed size buffer, right? Um, you may want to say, oh, my buffer is full. I want to interrupt the pipeline. And in a push-based model, that's quite e easy because all your state is stored in one central location. You can just store the state, set it aside for later. In a pull-based model, it's way harder because like I showed before, your state is your call stack and you can't really easily save a call stack. Um, in a similar vein, if you want to do async IO, right? Um, you kind of need to be able to pause your pipeline while you're doing the IO only to then resume it when you get like your callback or your, like your data is actually ready. And in a, uh, a push-based model that has the stack modeled as like the separate structure, you can again pause execution and resume it later very easily. So those are things that are just very hard to do in the pull-based model. Oh, question. 
Question, yes. So in the in this transition algorithm based model, is it possible that you could have synchronization bottlenecks? We have very large queries. The question was, could you have synchronization bottlenecks if you have parallel queries? Um, so that depends on the operators you're using, of course. Um, it, it could definitely happen if you have like things that do like socket connections and stuff like that, right? Uh, usually that's not, usually the only socket connections we have are on our sources uh, because we don't have like a, um, we don't have a client consuming this over like a socket, right? Um, so we don't quite run into that, but it, it could happen uh, if you, especially if you have like, um, yeah, sockets in multiple different locations, essentially. But even for the global state, right? The global state that you maintain for a query, that could become a problem. Like if every, every operator is trying to update the global state. Is, is yeah, so the, Go ahead. So, so the states, yeah, the global states that's kept for the pipeline itself, right? Um, and th yeah, th that's what usually holds stuff like the hash tables and stuff like that. So that's where so, like communication between threads happens. Um, it, it, it can definitely become a bottleneck if that's what you're what you're asking. Yep. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Cool. All right. So that's the execution. Now I want to talk a bit about uh, about storage. Let me check my time. Um, all right, I'll, I'll try to be a bit uh, quicker. Uh, so the storage, DuckDB uses a single file block-based storage format uh, with the write ahead log stored as like a separate file. And um, we also support ACID. And the way we do that is that we have these two headers in front of the file, which essentially allow us to do like a switcheroo within the file, right? So one problem, of course, if you are writing to a file, at any point, um, your computer could like run out of power. And you need to be able to do like a atomic switch between two versions. And that's what these two headers are for. So we can we can essentially write all the data we want to a file. And then at some point do like the switch rule where we go like, oh, now we're using the new version instead. Um, all of our blocks are all fixed size. And the reason for that is that because we have this single file, we can never really delete the file, right? And we want to re we really want to avoid fragmentation within this file. So we have just fixed size blocks all over, which is uh, blocks of 256 kilobytes. Um, our tables, they're partitioned into row groups and e every row group has around 120K rows, which is around 60 of our vectors. Um, and these row groups, they're kind of the parallelism and checkpoint units. So um, often if you do like a checkpoint, for example, you don't want to rewrite your entire table, obviously, because it might be very big, um, so if you have like a delete or updates or something, you can instead rewrite only a single row group. That's kind of the idea behind these row groups. Um, they're also a unit for which the check, the, the parallelism is done, right? So the sources distribute the row groups over different threads. Um, we also support compression and it's kind of a critical thing. Um, I think with the column store, at least it's very nice to have. And that's because compression, it works very well with column storage, one of the big benefits of column storage. And compression is kind of cool because not only does it reduce your file size, it can actually make queries faster as well. And one of the, reason is, one of the reasons is this compressed execution that we're doing, right? Uh, with these vectors that we have shown. Um, but another is that it just, it can speed up IO, right? Like sometimes IO is the bottleneck. You're reading from a slow disk, you're reading over a socket connection uh, from a network. And compression can make things faster as well as saving you disk space. So when it comes to compression, there's kind of two schools of compression. You have general purpose heavyweight compression, um, which is stuff like GZIP, Z standard, Snappy, LZ4, uh, like stuff you're probably familiar with, stuff you've used. And that works by just finding patterns in bits, right? Like it's data type agnostic. And then you have special purpose, lightweight compression models like RLE, bitpacking, dictionary, frame of reference. And that those work by finding very specific patterns within the data. Now, general purpose compression, it's great because it's very simple to use, right? Like you just call a method called compress in the library and you're there. Um, and it works great if you want to save space. However, there is generally a higher sort of decompression speed there, which can slow down query execution, right? Like you have to decompress this stuff all the time. 
And in the case of DuckDB, we're actually keeping data compressed in memory. So it's not just about reading from disk, it's about reading from memory and memory is very fast. So having decompression there uh, that's slow can, act, can have a significant impact on, uh, on performance. You also generally need to decompress these in bulk because they work by optimizing like blocks of data. So you can't just do random seeks or do compressed execution in them. You just need to decompress them and then it's over. So lightweight compression, because it works by detecting these specific patterns can actually be much faster than general purpose compression. And these patterns can then be exploited during execution like what we saw with our vector formats. There is a downside, which is that these patterns are generally very specific. So if a pattern is not there, it has no effect. There's no positive uh, effect on your uh, compression ratio. And that means we generally need to implement like many of these kind of algorithms, not just a one and done kind of thing. Um, and it also means we have to choose them. So in DuckDB, the way compression works is that per row group, right? That's our checkpoint unit. We look at each column and then we go through two phases. We do an analyze phase where we look at the data and we say like, hey, which method is the best? And then we have a compressed phase, which says, hey, now we actually do the compression and writing this stuff disk, right? Um, so these lightweight compression methods, at this point, we support quite a few of them. We have been adding more and more over time. Uh, there's uh, th This was from a blog post that I wrote that's linked there uh, at the end of last year. We have actually implemented a few more compression methods since then. And you can kind of see this cool effect where as you add more compression methods, right, the the size of the tables go down because there's more patterns to be found. And you can also kind of see that depending on what, depending on the data set, some are more or less effective, right? You can see that dictionary was like a very big win. Um, but on, for example, the FCST algorithm made a giant difference on the line amp data set, but not that much of a difference on the on time data set. That's because these uh, compression methods, they work by finding very specific patterns. And if the pattern is not there, it just doesn't help, right? Like it, it, it doesn't work. Cool. Okay, so that's the storage. I do have a lightning round where I have like a bunch of quick, uh, like one slider things on other components, uh, but I'm also happy to answer questions if uh, we don't have any more time. We have, we have plenty of time. Uh, All right. A, a quick question, like what is, <clears throat> you guys have been your book pool, right? Like, yeah. Right, it, like, and it's, <clears throat> is there anything special about that, or is there, is there a classic LRU? Uh, yeah. So I have one slide on that. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I I I, uh, I could have talked a bit more about this. So we implement a buffer manager that's very similar to Lean Store. Um, right. It has some differences there, though. So we have a lock-free sort of queue where we have kind of like sort of LRU, right? Like it's not actual L L LRU because that requires a centralized data structure, which we want to avoid. Um, but we have kind of sort of LRU, but the functionality is very similar to what you would expect from a traditional buffer manager. Got it. We, 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 we didn't cover the Lean Store paper, but uh, this is helpful, thank you. Cool, yeah, so Lean Store, uh, kind of the key takeaway there is that it works by having the like no, as few centralized data structures as possible. So the actual handles, they're stored in like the pointers to the buffer handles. And that allows you to have like, well, a very high degree of parallelism because all, all the operations are kind of on separate buffers usually, right? Like one thread reads one row group, one thread reads another row group. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's faster for parallelism. Got it. Cool. Any more, ah, another question? Juan has a question. Uh, Juan, go for it. Hi, could you briefly describe how query cancellation works in DuckDB? For example, can you stop an ongoing hash table build or would you wait yeah. for it to be done? Yeah, so I can definitely describe that. Uh, we do support query cancellation. That's actually one of the other advantages of the central location flow. Um, essentially, whenever we have a operator come out, like a, a bunch of vectors come out of a um, an operator or go into an operator, we return control to the central location and that can then handle all the query uh, cancellation. And the nice thing is because it's a vectorized model, right? Even if you have operators that process a large amount of data, like a cross product or something, um, at some point you will produce like 
one vector of data in one intermediate. And that can then immediately be canceled. So the query cancellation is very, uh, it works very well. Thank you. Hey, uh, I have a question about the storage. So mm -hmm. for something like compaction the storage, because like you are using a VCC, so it is possible that some old version is not used anymore and you only need to like free up the space used by old version by, for example, merging to like half full blocks. Because like a year ago, when I was looking into the DuckDB issue list, there were some mm -hmm. users complaining like, they are using Python with DuckDB, they ingest mm -hmm. a lot of data and they delete the full table, but there's still like a lot of memory usage. So I'm not sure if mm -hmm. like, now Yeah, so I have, a, we indeed, I have actually been working on this like last week. We indeed don't yet do compaction. Um, but that's mostly just because we haven't gone around to it yet. It's like, uh, uh, yeah, we do reuse of the blocks, right? So what we do is um, whenever you destroy a row group, we mark the, the blocks as they are free and they can be reused, right? Uh, so that works. But we don't yet actually go through the effort of like making the file smaller. So the file can only grow at this point. Um, as for the MVCC, our MVC is actually only in memory. We don't write the um, we don't write the versions to the storage, so it's a bit different from the way that Postgres does MCC, for example. Uh, like all of our transactions are exclusively in memory, and like all the MCM information, it's, it, it it doesn't really need to be stored, right? Because once the system shuts down, um, like your transactions are canceled anyway, right? You like. For the checkpoints, is that something like I think, like obviously if you close the process, you checkpoint and write everything out, but it, it does it do it automatically in the background or does it, or, or does it like when, when the, when the white head log gets so full and then you do a checkpoint? Yeah. So we have a threshold that we checkpoint after the right head log gets to a certain threshold. Um, and we also do optimistic writing to the, like, um, so when you're, loading data into the system, we won't write to the right headlock at all if you're loading a lot of data into the system. So we will write directly to the database file, directly compress stuff. Uh, that's actually quite new. I think that's like half a year old or so, but that speeds things up a lot if you're doing like bulk loading, which is super common use case for us. Got it. Uh, Cheese also a special case. He likes to read the issue lists of open source databases in his spare time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't think, don't, that makes it sound like we're stalking you. No. <laughs> no. Okay, cool. No. Any other questions? No. In the back, yes. So what do you think the role of UDS is? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are your future plans in UDS or UDS? Can you repeat, repeat the question for you, Mark? Yeah, please. The question is, what is the role of UDS uh, mm -hmm. and what do you think the future of UDS are in WDB? So I think it's a good question. We're actually working on implementing uh, a bunch of different, uh, mostly Python UDFs right now. And we do have UDFs in uh, like JavaScript already, and we're gonna probably implement Wasm UDFs as well. Um, and of course you can make have extensions to DuckDB that implement UDFs. So I think there is a, a, a bright future for it. I do think there is one sort of uh, thing there, which is that UDFs are actually less important in DuckDB than in, uh, like a system like Postgres. And that's because you can pull data out of DuckDB so fast and push it back in so fast that often stuff you might want to do with the UDF and Postgres, you can just do by pulling data into your application instead. Right. Good point. Abby, your point. So now, because we're all showing our own respected research projects, how are extensions <laughs> implemented in DuckDB? How are extensions support for extensions implemented in DuckDB? So yes, we have extensions. Um, here you go. Uh, this is uh, my slide on that. Um, so actually, we have been working a lot on extensibility in DuckDB. And I think it's kind of important for us because we don't, we like one of the things we like about DuckTV is that it's quite small, like it's a compact system, right? And a lot of the stuff people don't need necessarily, right? So we have, for example, this ICU extension, the International Components for Unicode, that does stuff like implement 
uh, collations and stuff like time zones. And, and that requires like a big database of all, all, of all these language models, like all, all these languages and stuff. And it's a very useful feature, but a lot of people also don't need it. So um, it's, it's quite critical for us, especially for the Wasm build uh, that runs in the browser. That's, I think, this one. We have a Wasm build that runs in the browser. Um, that you have like a small core. So a lot of the stuff that we implement ourselves is actually implemented in extensions. Like for example, our Parquet reader is an extension. It is an extension that's often bundled, but it's an extension. Our JSON support is like fully an extension. Um, so yeah, you, you can do a lot in extensions. You can build your own extension and then you can load them. Um, and yeah, it's a shared library. It's somewhat straightforward. Um, there is the thing with extensions now, if you're doing it now, it does tie in quite heavily with our internals and we are changing our internals sometimes still because we're like, uh, so like you can get it working with one version of DuckDB, it may not necessarily work with the, like the next one. And we're moving a lot faster than something like Postgres is, right? So like things are changing at, at, a, at a higher pace, but you can do a lot with extensions and we actually, released last week our uh, geo extension. So you can do like, uh, yeah, which does a bunch of cool stuff with like uh, geospatial algorithms and stuff like that. So yeah, you can do a lot with extensions. And are your extensions just like in the Postgres case where they're, they're like, you override the yeah. hooks and then the at runtime DB look to see whether this, this book is ever written and it calls that, or is there something more fancy you're doing? So our C++ extensions actually kind of hook into almost the entire system, which is also, why this is like so prone to breaking if we change the system, right? Um, we also have C level extensibility, which is far more stable, but because it doesn't hook into the entire system, it's also less uh, feature, like you can extend less things, right? Like we basically need to implement a uh, API that extracts this functionality. Um, but yeah, you can essentially do a lot of different things. So one cool thing, well, we have pluggable file system, so you can implement your own file system. Um, one thing that's kind of cool is that we have fully pluggable catalogs. So uh, this is something I added very recently, like a few months back. And you can essentially have, like we have our own catalog, right? Which has tables, it has views, it has sequences. One thing we can do is have a fully custom catalog within DuckDB. And that means you can create tables within that catalog. You can create views within that catalog. So um, we've implemented this for SQLite. And what that means is you can attach a SQLite database and like run queries on it, like it is a DuckDB database, create tables on it, in it like it is a DuckDB da database. But in the end, it's a SQLite database, right? So you can, you can open it and in SQLite. Um, and you can have like a full, fully custom catalog in your extension, essentially. Yes. Question, yes. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, like, in terms of, say, like, slightly different from what everyone was asking, but in terms of the long term, like, where exactly do you see DuckDB and, like, are you planning on replacing SQLite everywhere, or what's the... Is it SQLite Bro Store? So, yeah, like, yeah, like, it, that's the only, like, SQLite like on every cell phone. Right, but yeah. like, it can be that you have DuckDB on every cell phone, kind of that kind of thing, or, like, what, what's the large broad goal? Yeah, I mean, so obviously our goal is world domination, right? Like that's clear. Um, I I think it will be hard to beat SQLite in terms of ubiquity, right? Like SQLite is like running literally everywhere. I also think that analytical systems, they're probably a bit less generically useful than transactional systems. Um, but I do think there is like a, yeah, we definitely, we want everything that DuckDB can solve, we want DuckDB to solve, right? So um, I've already shown you, we have a Wasm build. We actually also have like a Swift package, for example. So you can run it on your phone, you can run it on your browser. Um, and there is some very cool stuff you can do with that uh, where, you, uh, where you can run DuckDB in place where you normally wouldn't really expect a database system to work very well. You can now use the database system using DuckDB. So yeah, definitely we, we want to go to like as many places as possible. Wait, like SQLite runs on airplanes because they had to get like avionics certification, right? And it took them a year to do that. 
But it's a bit like Ducky B's not gonna run on an airplane ever, anytime soon. Maybe on the entertainment system. Yeah. <laughs> it can run type SQL queries. Yes. <laughs> What's the most interesting like implementation trick in DuckDB? Sorry, the most interesting implementation trick? Like, like just like little like I don't know. You like implement a system. You're like, oh yeah, we have to like do this to solve this problem. We have to do like this thing, but like it's not something that you would have like expected it to be. Does that make sense? Did you run into anything like that? Oh, um, that's that's it's hard to answer. What is the most interesting? I think there is a lot of like um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that we had to like we thought would be one way, and then we had to rewrite all of our code because it wasn't right. <laughs> so I think the I mean the, the the whole execution model is one of those right. Like we switched the push-based model. Um, another one is the vector format. So one thing that we had in, initially was we didn't have this fancy vector format. We just had arrays. And then we were like, oh, um, hold on a second. Uh, people actually want to use nested types, right? So we had to rewrite that. Uh, I think like almost everything in DuckDB has been rewritten several times. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to answer what is the most sort of like uh, impactful there, but. I guess, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I mean, Mark, if you gotta go, you gotta go. I right. we have we have ten minutes if you want to finish up. Yeah, I'm happy to be here for ten more minutes. No worries. Oh right, yeah, go for it. Go for it. All right, do you have the lightning round slide? Do you want to go through those? Sure, sure, sure. I can. Uh, so I already went through a bunch of them, uh, but I can go through uh, the ones I didn't go through. Yeah. So um, yeah, so the out of core, it's something that's um, kind of like a a staple of database management systems, right, is that you want to do large than memory execution. And most systems support this in a good capacity. Um, just by having a streaming engine, you already support this in a lot of ways, right? Like if you have a streaming vectorized engine, you can do small aggregates with a larger than table data set size, no problem. However, there's still a bunch of these material materialization endpoints. Like you have a hash table for your join, you have a hash table for your area, you have a like sorting data requires materialize. Um, you have like a window segment tree for your window functions. And um, like I think traditionally, systems have always been kind of either they always take the slow path, right? Like they always do this on disk sort of thing, or they have a fast path for when things fit in memory and then switch over to a slow path when it doesn't. So you have like this optimized rule that basically says, oh, I can't do a hash join anymore. I'm going to do like a sword merge join or something. Um, and I'm going to do like an out of core sword and it's going to be like a, a merge, a big out of core merge sword is going to be very slow. So one of the things we have been wanting to do in DuckDB, uh, we have been, well, I think succeeding quite well is to solve this problem of larger than memory execution, but have this very graceful performance degradation where you basically say, okay, we try to use as much memory as we can. And if your performance, if like your data barely doesn't fit in memory, we want to write as little as possible to disk and also still use like this, these algorithms that are optimized for memory. So uh, Lawrence on our team has been working on this and he's been, he's actually doing his PhD on this. And he has some very cool tricks where, uh, for example, like in hash join, we do like uh, radix partitioning um, and then dynamic repartitioning based on how much data there is to be able to keep on doing a hash join. And one of the things that was kind of cool there is that um, in in like our MacBooks, the, the 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 disks like the SSDs, they're so fast that even when you go like massively out of core, like you're operating on like an eight gig data set and you have one gig of memory. Um, it's still actually, it doesn't get that slow. You don't get like a performance cliff where you go like, oh, suddenly it's like a hundred times slower. It can actually still be quite performant. So it's definitely worth um, yeah, worth doing all these cool tricks. Uh, yeah, so there, there's a bunch of papers on there. We have some blog posts as well, if you're interested in more. Um, yeah, so the transactions, uh, like I said, it's based on Hyper's MCC model, uh, but then we have this optimized for batch operations for vectorized processing. We support snapshot isolation. 
and we do optimistic concurrency control. I uh, won't go too much into in detail there. Uh, there's a paper you can read. Um, yeah, and if you don't know what MVCC is or you haven't had it in this course, then uh, more to learn in the paper. So they should know. And Sorry, they, they should know. Yeah, they know. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Mm. I think one of the sort of most sort of killer features of DuckDB is our support for external format. So that's something that has been very powerful since the beginning, but is even more powerful now. Um, and it's basically our table functions are like data ingestion, our scans, they're super flexible. And our own scans use the same extensible scan that everything else does, right? So that our scans are not special. And I think that has allowed us to build a lot of like very efficient integrations with a lot of different uh, data sources. And it's one of the cool use cases I think of DuckDB is that you can really, you can go to and from very different data formats. And you can also use this to like do data conversions, right? Like you can load Parquet files into SQLite using DuckDB. Um, and you can do like queries on Pandas data frames and convert results to CSVs. So there's this like sort of cool combination that this enables. And it's even, I think it works very well together with our in-process nature because we can query like in-memory arrow data structures or in-memory Pandas data frames, R data frames directly and ingest them into our engine in this vectorized manner and combine data from different sources as well. Although there is like kind of unique optimization challenges that you didn't uh, like arrive at because one of the things that if you operate on your own tables is very easy is that you know, like you were in charge of gathering the statistics, right? So you know you have this and this available. Whereas if you operate on like CSV files, suddenly there's no statistics. If you operate on the Pondus data frame, okay, you have like a cardinality, but that's it. And if you operate on a parquet file, you have like min-max indexes, but maybe not everything you have in your local storage. So doing like join order optimization under like the constraints statistics case, it's a it's an exciting sort of, a, it's a sort of interesting um, problem. Like how do you do that efficiently? Um, yeah, so the plug locale, like I mentioned, the file systems as well. Um, so yeah, one cool thing as well, you can read stuff over S3, over HTTP using DuckDB, um, and that works using our, it works through an extension, through our file system layer. So you can kind of inject a file system into DuckDB that can then intercept all the open calls, the read calls, uh, the write calls. And that allows us to have this sort of extension that implements a HTTP file system, a S3 file system, um, and allows you to read data from remote things, which is yeah pretty useful as well. Um, extensions that I've been over, Wasm. And yeah, that would, those were my remaining lightning slides. Uh, yeah, so this stuff you guys already know. We have a website, we have source code. Um, if you guys want to look at our issues or open new ones or open PRs as well, then of course you're more than welcome. Um, yeah, so once again, thanks for having me. And if there's any more questions, I'm happy to take them. Otherwise, uh, 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 question, yes, go for it. So um, due to the special um, subdivisions of, uh, you know, that TV is targeting, it has actually a unique competitor uh, different from other database systems. Like some some data free uh, systems are also competitors for that TV, such as, you know, pandas in Python and uh, uh, the data frame in R. So I wonder if in the future that TV will support uh, some similar APIs such uh, like those data free systems. Because based on my observation, uh, that TV still does not perform as well as those systems in some simple queries. You don't need to go through those traditional steps that, that the database, you know, query, uh, parsing the query and doing optimization and, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. right cost and stuff. So it's possible that DuckDB in the future can um, can provide APIs such as the data break. So users, for example, can uh, query the data table as the data frame and uh, it, it is fast to retrieve a uh, data from a particular presentation of the data table, mm -hmm. the row ID and, and column name and stuff. Um, so we can, do, we can we are free to uh, all that DB APIs inside a frequent loop 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we actually already do support this and have supported this for a while. Um, it's it's clear, it's, it's like, it's obviously not our main focus, right? Like our main focus is SQL, um, but we do have a data frame style API. And the way that works is it, it essentially constructs like DuckDB query nodes based on these API calls. So it's, it's a great point. We do have it, at least in the Python and C++ clients. Uh, I think in the R client as well, but not in all the clients. Um, yeah, it, it's very useful. I think also, yeah, in some sense, data frame libraries are competitors because they do diff they do they can do kind of the same thing, but we also work very nicely together with them, right? Like so, that's also one of the cool things about DuckDB is that the interop is very nice. So you can use DuckDB to run like SQL over a Pandas data frame or something. You don't need to use either or; you can use both. Cool. What does the query optimizer look like? Is it like is it top down or bottom up? Um, so it, it, we have a bunch of different ones. It's actually, I, we have been meaning to refactor it because it's kind of, we have a very structured expression rewriter and that has like the nice rules and stuff, but our logical operator, uh, like our query tree optimizer, it's kind of messy. Um, we have like specific, we have like a mix of kind of rule-based and, um, cost-based the, the, the join order stuff is all cost-based, of course, then we have some rules, but it kind of like, yeah, it, it, it's a bit mixed yeah. and messy. Like we, we, we need to rewrite this. Yeah, okay. All right, last question to be, what's the most surprising use case you've seen somebody use DuckDB? Pooh, that's hard. I think the when the Wasm stuff came out, that was quite surprising to me because I was like, oh wait, you can run this in a browser. And then I was like, oh, wait, it's actually useful. Yeah. Um, because there's like, people are doing stuff like um, running stuff like Tableau or something in a browser, right? Yeah. And then being able to load your data into your browser and then do like local data transformations, that's very powerful because you don't have to round trip anymore. So I, I think that's definitely one of the things that surprised me the most, right? I was like, okay, I hadn't thought of this. You know, like all the data science stuff that we have thought of that, that's why we made it. Um, but it, this was definitely, yeah, one of the surprising things. Okay, awesome. All right, let's. Quick question. What is it? Yeah. Question. The point is basically on paper that you give us the real. Basically, you say that uh, the embedded database has to basically keep track of the resources. And my question is, how does that DB keep track of resources? For example, let's say if you do run out, run out of memory, how do you keep track of that? Do you have like a fixed memory usage that you assign to that DB when the document is possible? All right. All right. So his question is because I made yeah. I made him read the, the demo paper uh, from you guys. Like, how do you keep track of resources? Yeah. So um, for threads, we have our own thread pool that we use to manage the threads, and also because it like to be can be used as a library, we allow if users have their own thread pool already, we allow them to call like to integrate with our thread pool or like to have their to use their thread pool to work on like to be tasks. Uh, for memory, we have our buffer manager, which has indeed a fixed memory limit, and we'll start unpinning things if possible when that memory limit is exceeded. <laughs> That's my favorite all <laughs> What is it? Yes, it's the SD Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. Ice cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so y'all yeah, fool, cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watt, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of a boy. Six pack 48 gets the real pounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>